Well, good evening, EBC family. Thank you once again for joining us as we study the full armor of God together. I am back. I'm not your regular face. You guys are so used to Pastor Andrew, and he has been doing an exceptional job walking us through the book of Ephesians, the six pillars, these six important chapters on, on the foundation of the church. And I love how Paul strategically divides the book, three into belief and three chapters on behavior, three on character and three on conduct, right? And, and as we've been going through, we've been looking at how he wove all throughout the book the idea of truth and honor and identity and who we are as children of God, in the family of God, in the army of God. And so tonight as we begin, um, let's pray. And we're going to be talking about Satan's schemes. He is the father of lies. And we need to know truth. It's when we know truth and experience truth that that truth will set us free. So Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that as we study to show ourselves approved, as uh, workers who can rightly divide truth. We pray that you will give us understanding tonight. We pray that you would illuminate our minds and that it will be easy to grasp and comprehend the truth of your word. Thank you that this is a living word. It's powerful. It's sharp. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so tonight we love your word and we humble ourselves to say, speak, God, speak to us. Give us understanding so that we can live out these principles as soldiers in the army of the Lord. And this is our prayer tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have the privilege of teaching the belt of truth. And why is it important that we know truth? Because there are so many lies. Beloved, we have seen how Satan plants lies in our hearts by suggestions, thoughts, and ideas. His goal is to make us, the body of Christ, weak and ineffective, that we would operate under his scheme of lies and not the power of truth. Thankfully, against his lies about our identity, God provides the, harm, the hammer of salvation. Let me say that once again. Against his lies of our identity, God provides the hammer of our salvation. We have been chosen and loved by the Father. We are the redeemed and the blessed by the Son. We are empowered and equipped by his Holy Spirit. So we can boldly, confidently reject Satan's lies about who we are. For we are the head and not the tail. We are above only and never beneath. We are not nothings and nobodies. We are God's dearly loved children. Satan has a strategy rooted in lies that uses that he uses against us. It's a strategy designed to confuse us of our identity and our authority and to lead us in paths that will take us contrary to the word of God. He wants to lead us in paths that will make our lives meaningless and empty. Satan's first strategy was revealed in the first book, Genesis, the book of beginnings. It's a strategy that was played out in the Garden of Eden. There God warned the first pair against eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eating its fruit, God said, would lead to death. And when Satan entered the garden, y'all know the story. When Satan entered the garden in the guise of a serpent, he said, oh, to wean Eve from the truth and fill her with lies. That's the trick of the enemy, to wean us from truth and fill us with lies. Satan told Eve that rather than leading to death, eating this fruit of the forbidden tree would lift her up so that she could become like God. Lies, lies, lies. If you don't know truth, if you don't grasp and hold on to truth, you will believe the lie. God says Satan was, uh, um, sorry, God said Satan was jealous, envious, 
did not want humans to possess his knowledge and his power that would come with the fruit. Eve listened to the lies and then relied on her senses. The fruit looked and it smelled good. And she wanted what Satan was offering. She chose to believe Satan lies rather than God's truth. She was deceived. And Satan's lie held her captive. It snared her. It ensnared her in a trap. And in response, she abandoned God's revelation and bought Satan's deception and distortion of truth. That's what a lie is. It's a distortion of the truth. It marvels. I marvel at the fact how people will say a white lie, a little lie. It was not a big lie. It's just a distortion of truth. Let's not respond like Eve did, abandoning God's revelation and buying into Satan's deception, and then going to eat. I'm so glad, although that's an Old Testament reality, we also have a New Testament principle, because in confrontation with the Jewish leaders of the day, recorded in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus brought both Satan's character and one of his strategies into clear focus. Yes, he did. Christ said when he, Satan, lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a father of lies. He is a liar and the father of lies. I love how Jesus just exposes him for who he is. Jesus unpacks his character. He tells us about his schemes and say, listen, when he speaks, this is his language. This is his tongue. This is the only language he knows. Some of us only know our mother tongue, and his mother tongue was that of lies. He's a liar and the father of lies. And the Bible has much to say on the strategy of Satan. So hear me well, Emmanuel. Well, when we don't know the truth, the whole truth, it is easy for us to buy into the deception of truth. In his word, God has revealed what is right and good and noble and honest and trustworthy. This truth leads to blessing. Satan's strategy is to use lies to confuse humanity, to entice us to choose something that is not desirable. He'll make it look desirable as if we want it, which in fact ultimately leads to our sorrow and our regret. Everything that glitter in gold, it may look good to us, but it's not good for us. And throughout scripture, there are more than a half dozen terms that unveils his strategy. Words translated such as illusion, deception, to deceive, to make fool of, deceitfulness, dishonesty, empty, worthless fantasy. Many words to depict, to describe his strategy. And while God reveals belief and attitudes and values as a way of life that brings blessing, Satan brings curse with distortion. He spins lies that appeal to our craving as human beings. He wants to fill the craving of our sinful nature, the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, and the boasting of what we and, and may have and what we can do. That's what 1 John chapter 2, 16 declares in the word of God. 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This is not of the Father. It is of the world. We are in the world, but we don't operate like the world. We're not conformed to this world. Such attitudes and values are woven into scripture called the world which we might better render as our human culture. This is the society in which we live. Our society, like every other human society, have chosen to believe and act on Satan's fantasies, his deception rather than what on God reveals. We all live among people who, like Eve, have chosen to believe Satan lies. This world that we live in values possession 
over people. We want achievement over relationships. We want success over work. The world believes that it's about the bigger house and, and the newest car that will bring us value and our happiness. But you can have money and still not have joy. You can have money and still not have peace. The world is attracted by beauty rather than character. We want charisma, but where's the character? We want the lights, right? The world celebrates success, although many ignore family in the pursuit of success. And Satan has spun us into a web, a web of lies that make this, these items seem so important in life. To make us believe what we value is what God values. And what makes life significant is precious in the eyes of God. Remember, he breathed into us the breath of life. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and life to the fullest. When we know this truth and we experience the truth that comes from God, then we have life. But in this world of, of illusion, we're under the control of the evil one if we buy into his deception. We desperately need the belt of truth. This is our defense against the lies woven against society. This is our defense against the lies of the enemy. We need the belt of truth. And please note that the NIV translation on Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 reads, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Stand firm having the belt of truth buckled around your waist. I love that picture. And although it's a vivid translation, we can literally see the soldier. Can't you see the Roman legionnaire standing there strapping on the belt of truth, strapping on this wide, thick belt? We can almost see the sword hanging, the knife hanging, everything hanging from this arsenal, this belt of truth. And while it's a vivid picture for us, the image of that translation that, or that that translation conjures up in our mind is a false one. What did you say? I said, although it's a vivid translation, the image that conjures up in our mind is a false one. It's wrong because, first of all, the belt was not the last item to be put on. It was not the last thing that the Roman infantryman put on when equipping himself for battle. It was not the last piece. It was actually the first piece he put on. Secondly, we need to understand that, that this, this, this was wrapped around his ribs and his loins. And so he would not be able, the soldier would not be able to, to, to bend over, to kneel down and to strap the sandals around his calves. He would not be able to put on the breastplate over the sword and belt and knife. So what does that mean? The Greek translation literally says, Stand, having girded yourself with truth. That's the image. We call it the belt of truth. But the proper translation is just simply stand, having girded your loins with truth. It does not mention a belt. Hear me well. It doesn't mention a belt or define exactly what equipment was used by the Roman soldier. It just said that we stand in this truth. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. It's not a preposition. It is a commandment that we stand having girded our loins with truth. And while girding one's loins is a common expression in Scripture, really, it's only in Ephesians chapter 6. Not in the Old Testament, nowhere else in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, is the only verse that mentions girding yourself with truth in a military context. Because they need it. Vital support. We are in and fight 
We are in spiritual combat. This is a spiritual battle. This is warfare. We are engaged in warfare and we need vital support. What the Roman legionnaire guarded um, himself with was a sturdy, tightly wrapped leather girdle that reached from his ribs all around to his loins. The girdle provided essential support to the core. Oh, God, we need truth at the core of our being. I don't mean just in your toe, in your big thumb, just on top of your head. We need the truth at the core. This is our core value. This is what we're made of. This is the critical thing. The Roman legionnaire standing with his fellow soldiers in tight formation needed at the core support. He needed truth to be center. I wish we would be a people that would study to show ourselves truth. We want truth, the whole truth. We know that God is not like man. He cannot lie. We want truth. And it should not surprise us that Paul says, stand firm in truth. Don't be waved. Don't be tossed. Don't be driven by every wind and doctor. Stand firmly, confidently, boldly in this truth, having your loins, your core guarded with truth, girded with truth. We need the core support that comes from his word. That when the enemy comes with his lies and his suggestions and his innuendos, when he comes with these distortions at our core, hear me well, Emmanuel, at our core, we stand firm against the forces of the evil one, knowing we know truth. Living by God's word, wrapping God's truth tightly around us, provides just the support you and I need. We need to make the first step. Gird ourselves with truth. I mean, just wrap yourself. Tell somebody, I'm hungry for his word. As a deer pants for water, I'm hungry for truth. I can't live by bread alone. I need every word that comes out of the mouth of God, not out of the mouth of the enemy. With his strategy of lies, I need God to speak his word. Living word into my dying situation. The first step, beloved, is to be girded with truth. That's the first piece of the armor. I know I'm late in the study, but that's the first piece of armor that we put on. Truth is key. You can close the video now. You're done. You heard all you needed to hear. Truth is key. It's the key to wearing all the other elements of the armor. It's key to the rest of your uniform. This is what puts everything together. This is your core. Yes, you do need the helmet of salvation to protect you from the lies of the enemy. Yes, you need that shield of faith because there are going to be darts thrown at you. Yes, you're going to need to wrap your feet with peace so that you have inner peace, interpersonal peace, a peace that surpasses is all understanding, a peace that you would fight for, for justice. Yes, you're going to need the breastplate of righteousness so that you would know it's not even your righteousness, but it's his righteousness that makes us righteous. We stand in that righteousness, right? That we are justified just as if I'd never sinned. But now that we have the helmet and the shield and the sandals and the breastplate, thank God for the first piece that pulled it all together. And that's the truth. Now that we're fully equipped by living out the truth that God shows us in Scripture, we can stand and having done all to stand. Regardless what the enemy whispers, we stand. Regardless of the thoughts that he tries to plant in our mind or in our spirit, we stand. Regardless of she say, he say, they say, we know the truth. Please gird your loins with truth. Paul said, when you know truth, you will also see light. That's why I love how Paul writes. He's taking us all through chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. We're in chapter 5 right now, Ephesians chapter 5. But he talks about light. Light comes when you know truth. In Ephesians 5, he says, we know light, right? He's talking to us about the Christian lifestyle. We need to be people of light and truth. 
And Paul immediately emphasizes to be in light is to be in truth. Ephesians 5, verses 8 and 9. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. I'm going to repeat that. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. You can't separate light from truth. Ephesians 5, we continue, 13 and 14 says, Everything exposed by the light becomes visible, but it is the light that makes everything visible. It's the light that he will shine, that will bring truth alive in our life. So what is the link between truth and light? I'm so glad you asked. Truth refers us to reality. The seeing things as they really are. The things as God shows them, that is truth. Our problem is that we as human beings have lost touch with reality in our society. We have been conformed. I know we say, I'm in the world. I'm not of the world. Yeah, okay, I know. But there's some residue. We've been influenced. We've been impacted. And we don't want to say that. But we live in a world of illusions where Satan has spun lies and created webs that appeal to our old nature. It appeals to our old man. And that's the very thing that Paul implores us to cast off to take off your old man and put on Christ. Stumbling around in this world of illusion and distortion, we're unable to distinguish truth from from, truth from lies and right from wrong, between what we benefit and what will harm us. And we desperately need a trustworthy source. He's the light. In him was light and life, right? God has given us a beacon through his word. And this is our daily bread. We feed on this. This is our final authority. This is God-inspired word. Timothy said it's for all, it's for instruction and reproof. We are people of the word. It's his word that will shine light on every situation. In fact, Scripture is both light and truth. God's word is true because his teachings are in harmony with reality, but his word is light because it makes reality come alive. It brings light to situations and show us what's really going on. That we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spirits. Come on, we need to know who we're fighting. We need God to shed light on the dynamics and what's really going on. In the words of the Apostle Paul, it is light that makes everything visible, Ephesians 5 and 13. So you say, Pastor, can you just explain to me the meaning of truth? What are you talking about? Truth is often related as that which is authentic and real, reliable and trustworthy. Authentic, real, reliable, trustworthy. God's word is represented as truth, and it is reliable. It is trustworthy. It's a trustworthy revelation of the reality as made known by God. Jesus is light. Jesus is truth, and you can't separate one from the other. Jesus made a number of claims that upset the religious leaders in his time and in his day. And one thing he announced is that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That was John 8, verse 12. I am the light, not a light, the light. And anyone who walks in me, anyone who follows me cannot walk in darkness, but they automatically walk in light. This was too much for the Pharisees to, to, to grasp. This was just beyond their scope of reasoning, and, and it challenged them to a point that they quickly distorted uh, and deteriorated into charges um, and counter charges. And as we read the passage in the Gospel of, of John, we sense that Jesus' opponents were not listening to truth. They did not want truth. They wanted to maintain their distortion of life. Finally, Jesus shrugged shrugged his shoulders and gave up saying, you know what? 
when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am who I am. You will know that I am the one I claim to be. That was verse 28 of John 8. Jesus then turned to the Jews who were willing to hear and follow, who were willing to believe and to accept truth. And they, he made them a promise saying, if you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Did you hear it? If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. God, I love it. I love it. And now the translation puts it very clearly. It says, if you continue in my word, that is, if you live by what I say, if you put into practice what I teach you, then you are my disciples. Then and only then you will know the truth. And when you know this truth, you will be set free. Jesus never said no facts. He never said no opinions. He didn't say no the latest fad or the norms of society. He didn't say if you learn accurate information. Mm -mm -mm. He didn't say that. He did say, however, if you put my teachings into practice. Yes, God, you will experience truth. And that experience of truth will set you free. We don't need more knowledge. We need wisdom. We don't need more information. We need transformation. Jesus said, when you know truth and you come to experience truth, you will experience being set free. This truth is not just something that you get by mental assent. This truth is what life in Christ is all about. We are not called simply to believe or simply to behave. We're called to live in this truth. It's the core of our being. Our belief ought to affect our behavior. Our character shapes our conduct. And at the very core, we are people who want truth. I don't want just the latest survey. I want truth. I don't want the popular version. I want truth. Come on, we grow as a society and we stretch, but there's a great spectrum, you know, in, in, in philosophies and ideologies and ideas. But where is truth? Where do we study and divide and show ourselves? It is in coming to experience this truth and this lived reality as children of the Most High God that we are really set free. It's not about what Lottie Dottie and everybody say. You will know this truth. You will experience this truth. And that will set you free. It is not really surprising that the belt of truth represents putting God's word in the practice. This is not a book that belongs on a shelf. This is not a novel that you just read from first cover to the back cover. This is truth. He speaks in the sound of his voice. This is his love letter to us. Oh, that we would know the love of God that he demonstrated for us and giving us truth. Because from the beginning, he wanted to distort. He, the enemy, wanted to distort truth, wanted us to abandon truth, wanted to give us a perception of truth. But God said, I am truth. It's not surprising that truth needs to be lived out. It needs to be practiced. And so as I come to a close tonight, what is surprising is what the Apostle Paul goes on to talk right after, right after telling us about truth, walking in love and walking in love. Walk, sorry, walking in love, then he goes and walking in light. Paul goes into a household code language. Read Ephesians 5. Right after walking in love. Right after walking in light, he goes right in, leading us right into chapter 6, talking about a household code. He's laying a groundwork on how we take this truth and apply it to every area of our life, especially in our household. That's why it's called household codes. Household codes have long been popular in Hellenistic culture. 
And yes, there's a lot of secular literature out there, but the fact that there are household codes all throughout the New Testament, codes that talked about the duty and the responsibility of everybody in the household, Paul wants us to explore how the Christian code differs from secular code. You just can't say, well, this works for my neighbor, it's going to work in my house. This is what other kids are doing down the street. That's what we're going to do on our street. No, Paul said, what's the code in your house? If you're going to walk in love and you're going to walk in light, can you bring this light into your house? I believe, he said, there's a core for every family in its truth. The core of my family's life is my personal life and it's found in my relationships, how I interact with one another. It's not just knowing truth, it's living truth. It's putting truth in the practice. And he said, no better place than exists in your family. Live out God's word at home. That's what I'm talking about. Live out God's word at home. You just don't get dressed for action to go to because I got to go to work and I got to get dressed. I'm going to school and I got to get dressed. I got to put on the whole armor of God. I'm going to church tonight. You know those saints and those who ain't. I got to be dressed. How about being dressed in your house? That before you get out of your bed, God, helmet of salvation. God, bring peace to my feet. God, protect my heart with the breastplate of righteousness. God, shield of faith, I trust you. No weapon formed against me. And first things first, God, I wrap truth. Not the dream, not the nightmare, not the lies, but you're going to keep me in perfect peace because I know truth. Paul is saying, the core of any person's life is found in the primary relationships of life. And that's family. Living out God's word in the family. Paul's going to continue, as you continue to read through Ephesians, he's going to talk about the relationship between a husband and a wife and fathers and children and even um, the master and the slave. He said this word, this truth has to be lived out in our homes. So even tonight, we're not gathered church, we're the scattered church. But this truth should manifest itself even in your home, in my home. The person who knows us most intimately and whose lives will affect more deeply are our spouses, our children, and other family members. If we are to protect ourselves against the schemes of the enemy, against Satan's schemes and the demons who carry them out, we need to be sure we are living out God's words in our homes. At home, the very place where we take up residence. At home, the very place where the rubber hits the street. At home, with everything we say and do, has the potential to change lives and shape lives for the rest of their lives. I know our kids spend a lot of time at school. And we say, well, the teachers have greater influence. Shame on us if teachers have greater influence than we do over the seed God has trusted into us. As arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior, so are the children of one's youth. At home, with everything we say and do, we have the potential to build them up and we have the potential to tear them down. We must guard our families with truth. We must wrap them with truth everywhere, absolutely the truth of who they are and what they can be in the body of Christ. After introductory verses on the theme of Scripture as light and truth, the Apostle Paul turns his attention to the relationships in the family. And I'm not going to go into that because my time is up. <laughs> Y'all read that for yourself. For he has exhorted us to be wise, to understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he discusses God's will for spouses, for children, for the extended family. Living this truth is particularly important in our setting because we have great influence. Never underestimate the influence you have over their personality and over their character. Household codes were a recognized literary genre. Many of writers devoted theses and papers and writings to household management. A surprising number of the New Testament passages are this very thing, household codes. 
discussing life in the household. How can we be light to the world if we can't be light in our homes? How can we speak truth to the multitudes if we can't speak truth to the minority, the ones that are closer to our hearts? There is, however, a significant difference between biblical codes and secular codes. Our children, our spouses, our family members are going into this world day in and day out. But may we always present the belt of truth, wrapping them up in truth, because biblical code is not secular code. While the biblical codes are radical, (laughs) they're radical because in the life of the Christian husband, he's held accountable for how he loves his wife as Christ loves the church how he nurtures his children without exasperating them or provoking them to anger, how he treats fairly those who serve him. We, as men of God, are not to be dictators. We are to be servants to one another. Even on Sunday, I talked about not being aggressive, but you can be assertive. We are the living examples of God's word. And it starts at home. God, send a revival and let it begin with me. God, bring truth to your church. And we are the church. Let it begin with me. This is the kind of thing that the Ephesians households were dealing with. Paul gave them a code for living life in their homes. Because we will have no credibility We will have no integrity if we live one way on Sunday in a different way, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Only as each of us take responsibility for our activity. Only as each of us take on this mantle of servanthood that we will serve one another and submit to each other in the fear of God. It's only then that we will live out God's truth in our homes. It's only then that we're living in truth. Ephesians 5, 15 and 17. Let's be careful then how we live, not as unwise, but as the wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. His will is that we would walk in truth and that this will not just be a uniform we put on. It would be truth that we live out. We practice what we teach. We practice what we preach. When I became a young pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church, our oldest member at the time was Sister Jessie Ellison. I think she was 96 then. (laughs) And I was sweating and preaching and kicking one Sunday morning. And as I greeted her at the door, she said, Reverend, that was a lovely message. I heard a lovely message. I'm waiting to see the sermon. She was one of my greatest encouragers. But she said, bro, anybody can lip it. Not everybody can live it. I heard a message. I'm looking for the sermon. I believe every family member would say that. They hear the message. They want to see the sermon. They want to know, do we put on truth that will hold every other piece of the armor together? Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice tonight. God, that we would be messengers of truth not just in our speech, but in our conduct, not just in our verbiage, in our language, but in our actions. Make us people, God, that will prove who we are by how we live, that we would walk in love, that we would walk in light, that this truth would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We thank you for truth that will bind us together and bind every piece of the uniform. God, may we be the message that people not just hear, but see. We give you praise, we give you glory now for how you're about to use us where ministry really counts behind closed doors. Do something in our homes, we pray, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. God bless you. Pastor Andrew, your favorite one, will be back next week. Until then, walk in truth.